Good morning, Steve. How are you? I'm fine, Jamie. How are you doing today? Really good, really good. Well, thank you so much for joining this series of Sentientist Conversations. It's an honor to speak to you. Um, and as we've spoken about before, I'm trying to recast um, the term sentientism as a worldview that's committed to both evidence and reason and also having compassion for all sentient beings. So it's trying to answer two very basic, but I think important philosophical questions, what's real and what should we choose to believe and how should we believe, but also what matters and who matters morally. Um, but I'm talking to people in these conversations who would both agree and disagree with different parts of that worldview. So it'll be uh, fascinating to understand your you know, personal philosophical journey and your work and um, you know, where your thinking has got to so far. Uh, but before we start with those two questions, how would you best introduce yourself for people who don't know your life and your work? Okay, well, I'm uh, retired. <laughs> I've been retired since 1997. I was a professor of philosophy at the California State University uh, East Bay. That's the east side of San Francisco Bay. I grew up in Salt Lake City, uh, Utah. Not that I was ever Mormon, I wasn't, but uh, my father came from northern Greece and he thought that the topography around Salt Lake, the Great Basin, uh, semi arid, uh, mountainous countryside, countryside kind of reminded him of ancient, not ancient, uh, northern Greece. And so he uh, moved uh, us out there, us being my mother and myself, uh, the only three of us in the family. I was actually born in Manhattan. But anyway, I grew up uh, in Salt Lake. Um, um, I know you've asked other people about the religious uh, uh, background in the family. And my parents were very different. My mother came from southern France, for one thing. My father, as I said, from northern Greece. They met at a dance hall in New York in the city in the 1920s. Um, my mother was uh, fairly religious. My father, was a uh, honor thy father kind of Greek Orthodox. We went to uh, uh, services in the Greek Orthodox Church in Salt Lake on Christmas and Easter. I enjoyed going to them for the pageantry. I was like the pageantry of the Orthodox ceremonies. My mother was actually an orphan after World War I. She was raised in a Methodist uh, orphanage. Um, and so uh, came to the United States as an orphan with a, um, a family who wanted a French nanny, a French-speaking nanny. That was all the rage in the 1920s, apparently. And so she was Methodist. But then in Salt Lake, she discovered a different kind of religion, one that uh, originates from your part of the world, Jamie. It uh, was something called the Order of the Cross. I don't know if it still exists. Uh, it was um, a kind of a mystical reinterpretation of the Bible by an Anglican minister named uh, the Reverend J. Todd Ferrer. And his main work was, I think, something like a 30 volume mystical reinterpretation of the Bible called the, uh, the Herald of the Cross. Now, one of the tenets of the Order of the Cross was vegetarianism. Uh, the reason they were vegetarian is uh, that they believed in the transmigration of the soul, uh, like the ancient Pythagoreans, that they thought that uh, souls could move from different uh, animal forms to another upon death. So uh, uh, Pythagoras was uh, famous, uh, anecdotally at least, for saying, oh, I recognize my friend so-and-so in the bark of that dog over there, and so-and-so having died recently. So anyway, they viewed uh, <coughs> eating meat as akin to cannibalism. And so my mother uh, introduced me when I was uh, maybe 12 years old. She switched from Methodism to the Order of the Cross. And although I never was in, I don't have a religious bone in my body, frankly, um, I was never much interested in religion. And they didn't have a lot of pageantry, so I was disappointed in that. Um, but they, she did introduce me to the idea that you really don't need to eat meat in order to uh, have a healthy diet and enjoy your diet and so forth. So I've been a vegetarian uh, ever since, um, just for that reason that I don't see any, didn't see any need to, uh, to eat meat. 
Uh, after Salt Lake, I went to Rice University in Houston, Texas. I was particularly interested in science, mathematics, engineering, but my professors that I most enjoyed at Rice were in the humanities, uh, literature, history, philosophy. So I switched over, I became a philosophy major. My favorite philosopher there was fellow named Lewis Mackey, who was a great Kierkegaard scholar. And so I wasn't that much in Kierkegaard, since yeah, I don't have any religious interest. But anyway, I continued existentialism at the University of Paris for a year to study and mainly the French existentialist Maurice Moreau-Ponty. I uh, did my dissertation on him at Yale and uh, gained my doctorate in 1971. I got a job at the uh, say Cal State East Bay. It was called Cal State Hayward. Yeah? And stayed there until I retired in 97. Primarily, that's kind of young uh, because uh, I have a degenerative retinal condition and my vision had just gotten to the point where I didn't think I was doing a job that I should be doing for my students, whatever. So I retired. And here I am now. I live on the California's Pacific Coast, about 150 miles north of San Francisco. Um, I'm retired here. My wife and I do a lot of on hands uh, companion animal work. We have an organization we founded called Hayward Friends of Animals. Uh, we developed a volunteer program for the Hayward Municipal Animal Shelter. And up here on the Mendocino Coast, we have a program we call Second Chance, where we help low income uh, residents to be able to give their, their companion animals, primarily dogs, good quality lives. We help with vet bills, food, shots, uh, bay neuter, the whole range of them, kind of things that uh, we want to be able to help make sure that companion animals, even if they weren't fortunate enough to be born into a, a uh, wealthy or middle class family, can still have a good quality of life. Not only be loved, and don't have to be relinquished to the shelter, but also get good veterinary food and so forth. So, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and it's and you've gone from sort of philosophy of animal ethics to very hands on caring for non-human animals. So. Yes, I've always thought that philosophy should be not just a, uh, an Ivy Tower kind of pursuit. Actually, um, I'd say I've, I've been a vegetarian uh, since I was an early teenager, but I just did it myself, and I was doing really quite uh, academic philosophy and phenomenology and existentialism, and I kind of uh, found it not satisfying after a few years of teaching, and somebody told me about, well, there's this book, Animal Liberation, by Washington Peter Singers. I'm sure vegetarian, you might want to uh, look into that. It's the only philosophy book that has a cookbook at the end of it. And so I read that, and thought, oh, here's something that really does interest me personally, and I can pursue professionally as well. So I started teaching some courses on uh, animal ethics issues. And incorporating that in other introduction philosophy of reduction ethics courses. And it kind of went to kind of cease uh, publishing in philology, who did most of my work on uh, ethics, especially animal uh, ethics, as well as just general ethical theory and some environmental ethics. Yeah. Uh, and it's deeply foundational work as well. And we'll come back to that when we talk about this. I guess the moral question of what and who matters and your thinking there. Um, but to start with the first question, which you've already touched on this, you know, what's real and how do we choose what to believe? You talked there about, I guess, the religious context of your family and how that changed. Um, did your beliefs, did you believe uh, the same thing as your, you know, your mother particularly? Um, and have those beliefs held or have your thoughts about, you know, the supernatural religion naturalism changed over time as your thinking has developed? I, I went through the motions. Uh, so I went to church with my mother mainly, except on Christmas and, uh, and Easter when we with my father. Uh, I, never, I never really believed in God. Uh, it was not something that um, 
you know, touch me, appeal to me, whatever. I think the main reason it probably is a rationalization after the fact. I just, I, I just don't seem to have any of this. Religion. A friend of mine, Susan Finson, uh, a lot of work in animal ethics also, said that uh, she thinks you have to be born with a religious gene. And so she came from a family of holy women, extremely religious, but she never was, so she figured she didn't get the gene. Uh, I guess I didn't get the gene either. I never really uh, um, believed in uh, God or in the uh, spirit world or something of that sort. As far as a reason, the one thing that's always you know, been, uh, I guess, a particularly uh, convincing to me as to why there is no God is that there is so much evil in the world. There is so much stuff in the world. And it can't be blamed on women because there's evil, because there's a lot that humans cannot be assigned responsibilities. So, I know the arguments for it. Uh, I've gone through that. The last I mentioned, Lewis Mackey is also very much a Western medieval philosophy, so I don't that for somebody who's not in religious reading, fair amount of Aquinas and Scotus and Anselm and the other uh, medieval sculpture. I know the arguments for it, but uh, it's like Jeannie Morrison, you know, somebody might, uh, how do I convince you that there's something? real out there it was no idea and he said just you know let me bang your, your thumb with a rock and not a convince you there's something real out there so you can have all the abstract arguments about how we're not in a position to question god's uh understanding and god's the plan for the world and maybe all this uh suffering is actually necessary but there just seems to be so much of it that doesn't come to any good and so I think that is a, is a reason that's what I would be primarily for why I don't have any, any religious belief. Yeah. And it was, it's interesting because the guests I've spoken to so far, some of them, uh, are, you know, still have a religious worldview now. Some of them have, uh, most of them have moved away from a religious worldview. Um, and for those who moved away, for some, it was a really difficult journey because you know, religion was a very important part of their family and their society. And, you know, with a couple of them, they had to take some quite significant risks to, <laughs> to escape, if you like. For other people, and I think you're, you're probably in a similar camp to me, it wasn't really a traumatic thing to give up because we weren't particularly committed to it. You know, we didn't necessarily believe it that deeply. It didn't provide a moral framework for us. So it was quite an easy thing to, um, you know, to leave behind. Is that, is that fair to say? It wasn't really central to your way of thinking anyway or for me to give up uh gave me my sundays back i didn't have to go to church whatever which yeah, i didn't want to do my mother wanted me to go with her which i did and say so when we went to the orthodox church i kind of enjoyed those but that on aesthetic ground not the religious ground um so it really wasn't anything to give up because it's not something that i was valuing Particularly, at the time. You know, I, I, I you know, listened to several of your other conversations, and I know that you're when you ask the question of what is real, you're uh, aiming mainly at these religious issues. But uh, I wouldn't want to uh, say that that means that reality is somehow simple. I mean, there are all kinds of dimensions of reality that are not something that are amenable to scientific method or that um, you know are, you can experiment with like i think the meaning of a uh, a poem is uh, something that's real i don't think it's spiritual but it's not atoms in the void either but it is real i think our understanding of each other the meanings of words uh the colors we see as opposed to the wavelengths of light Colors you see are real, but they're not the sort of thing that uh, is in a way amenable to scientific method. The, uh, the contrast, discordances, aesthetic properties, and things, these are all real. They're not to somehow merely phenomenal or something of that sort. Um, you know, I think the mathematical formulae are real. They're not real in the Platonic sense of having a separate spiritual kind of reality, 
that they are real and that they are real parts of the world in which we live. And um, so I think that you know, saying that the reality does not have that uh, Bible sort of spiritual dimension, religious sort of spiritual dimension, doesn't mean that this impoverishes the reality. The reality is very complicated and things are real in, I think, five variety of ways. And I think that's really where the interest, my interest at least, in the medical considerations about reality and how we all lives. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So the, the second question we like to ask, some people um, want to keep these separate. They want to keep their epistemology very separate from their ethics, if you like. And for other people, there's quite a natural link, either because they have a religious worldview that gives them an ethical structure or because they find some more naturalistic grounding for their ethics as well. But, but regardless, and it would be interesting to know how you feel about that, but the two questions we ask here really about what matters are, you know, ultimately what is our ethics or our morality grounded in, if it has a grounding, and I know you've, you know, you've written defences of sort of relativistic approaches and, you know, subjective approaches as well. So that would be interesting to cover. But the second part of the question is about moral scope. And for many people, that's a journey um, about how their, you know, their moral scope and their natural compassion may be extended beyond family to out to the rest of the human species. And then as you've already hinted at, you know, thinking about non-humans and how do they matter? And obviously that's been the center of much of your work too. So two big questions, but about grounding of ethics and, and I guess also moral scope and your personal journey through that thinking too. I'll say in my last book in your talk, the subject of morals, where I try to develop the answer to those questions. So let me try to say it uh, uh, more quickly in, in, in that book. Um, I think morals uh, originally, morals are created by human beings. I think moral values are parts of the reality. Uh, because human beings are, if there weren't any human beings, there wouldn't be any human beings. So I think the moral values originate from what E.O. Wilson would call, I guess, the socio-biological side of human evolution and experience, as opposed to Richard Dawkins' selfish gene side of human development. And by that, I mean that um, the, the purpose, well, there may you say two kinds of families, uh, <clears throat> feelings, impulses, motivations that human beings have. One is the self-centered, okay? and the other is what I call other-centered, and that's the social, social, biological stuff. Human beings are herd creatures who is uh, infants uh, are born in a very dependent condition. So it's very important that uh, the species that we care about the well being of others as well as ourselves, the birds being you know, self centered. And there's uh, always, I think, a kind of struggle between those two families of interest the, the self centered and the other centered. And I think morals develop in order to reinforce the strength of our other centered motivations, because our other centered motivations uh, are much weaker than our self centered motivations. Um, and so morals develop in order to try to get us not to be so selfish. And this reinforces obligations to others. Compassion for others, obligations uh, to family, uh, it increases what I call uh, empathy and respect feelings. It gives them uh, more oomph to try to uh, combat our self centered feelings and to motivate actions then that will increase uh, uh, that you know, family, tribal, uh, locality, national. Um, Humanity, and there's no limitation to empathy. You know, empathy is trying to get us to care about the well being of others. There's nothing that ties it exclusively to those others being human, although I think from an evolutionary point of view, that's where they 
they got started. But there's nothing logical, there's a logical limitation to empathy, but it has to be um, limited to human beings. I think the only logical limitation is that those things about which we care in this sense of empathizing with them, in our respecting their interests, is that they have interests, that they have feelings, that they can feel suffering, they can feel pleasure and pain, fulfillment, frustration, driving, hunger, thirst, the whole panoply of these sorts of feelings. Um, we let our imagination sometimes go beyond those, that logical limit, actually. And we uh, or have animism where we project some kind of feelings into uh, inanimate objects, uh, you know, non-sentient uh, objects or entities. Um, but I think logically the only limitation that I'm aware of on uh, being motivated by feelings of empathy and developing moral values, codes, principles, and institutions in order to reinforce the strength of these other centered empathetic feelings is that these others actually have interests. Not interests that we or some other uh, human being are projecting onto them, but that they have interests of their own. For example, a lot of environmental ethicists like to talk about the well-being of, uh, of, of an ecosystem or a species or whatever. Uh, those are things that we care about. Um, they are also things that are important to the survival of a wide variety of uh, animals who have feelings and interests. But I don't know an ecosystem by itself doesn't care whether it's a drought or a rainy um, you know, tree doesn't care whether it's getting enough water, enough iron, or too little. It just these are just functional relations, and it's important to us, important to deer, important to rabbits, important to, to sparrows and hawks that uh, these trees and ecosystems thrive and function well, meaning that they thrive and function well for supporting. Uh, the owners whose uh, well being does depend on their family. Yeah. And I think the, you know, I share your view that morality is something that's constructed and arguably, you know, a, a very basic proto morality was evolutionarily constructed even pre humans, in that, you know, I'm sure long before humans arrived on the scene, mothers cared for their children and you know, there were also the more challenging aspects of morality and ethics around tribalism and uh, responses as well. So I, I, I agree that morality is a, you know, a constructed thing. It's not, um, you know, some sort of pure externally defined set of standards that's out there. But I didn't mean to say that uh, suggest that human beings are the only ones who empathize, who, you know, uh, care for their own, <laughs> who self-sacrifice and so forth. I just mean as far as them being moral values in some kind of code or institutional sense, I think they depend upon. And then, but I definitely agree with you. And I think I wrote an article way back when called Our Animals Moral Beings. And uh, that they are virtuous beings. They're not fully moral in the like, Kantian sense, and that they don't act out of respect for law or something of that sort. But they're virtuous beings in that they care for others, they will self sacrifice and so on. And ultimately, I think being virtuous is actually more important than being fully moral because being fully moral is just a way of trying to reinforce the uh, lack of uh, feelings of empathy that uh, some of us have. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of, one of the risks I sometimes see when people talk about you know, social construction of ethics is that there are some approaches to taking a sort of relativistic approach to ethics that to me can end up seeming almost amoral and that they seem to open the door to maybe arbitrary ethics and that they say, well, if this group over here, you know, constructs and agrees an ethic that, you know, involves needlessly causing harm to others, you know, who are we to judge what they have defined as a constructed ethic? Whereas what came through strongly from what you talked through is the safeguard against that is this fundamental recognition of, I guess, sentient beings having interests and those, you know, 
grounding our ethics however we can choose to construct them does that make sense so is that how you avoid the danger of arbitrariness in relativistic ethics by saying whatever your system is you have to have a consideration for each sentient being yeah you know one can have uh, an, an ethic uh, we mean by that uh, some kind of code principles of behavior one can construct that and it can be any sort of a code it can be one that uh, can be a hunting ethic it can be a an ethic for uh, an early autocratic society, uh, for early vicious society, slave owning society. We can have all sorts of codes of ethics, that's the codes of behavior. But in order to be moral, it must, I say, be functioning to try to combat our strongly self centered feelings and motivate us to have a wider uh, spec- uh, perspective. So that uh, we reinforce our ability to be compassionate, our ability to care about more than ourselves. And I think if you look at virtually all the recognizable moral principles, they all involve this idea of don't be selfish in one way or another. Right? And a lot of times that focuses on being impartial, like um, well, do you do only that which you can, or concerts, you know, do only that which you can realize in the universe a lot. Um, do what others you would have them do unto you. You know, keep your promises, even though uh, it turns out that keeping the promise is not against is against your current interest. Um, but you made a promise, and you should keep your work because the other others depend on it. Be kind to others. Don't uh, create cruelty unnecessarily. All of the recognizably moral principles, as opposed to just the arbitrary ethics, uh, involve trying to reinforce um, our concern beyond ourselves and to combat our selfishness. So I think that does put, as you were suggesting, a limitation on um, even though morals are created and constructed by uh, human beings, that in order to be a moral system, it, um, it needs to perform that function. And that puts a limit on the arbitrariness of yeah, thank you. And I think to, to me, that is, is a really important backstop or a safety mechanism, if you like. We can respect lots of different maybe cultural ways of thinking about ethics, um, but, but we have to ground it with that safety mechanism of recognising the moral salience of every sentient being and recognising that, you know, at least minute, you know, needlessly causing harm or death to a sentient being is a moral negative. And that I think one of the themes that comes through your work is is also being very pluralistic about the specific ethical system you might choose to apply as well, because many people in these fields have focused on sentience and the capacity to experience, the capacity to suffer, the having of interests and needs as the sort of primary criterion for moral consideration. Um, But there are so many different ways you can then develop that. So obviously, you know, Singer went down a utilitarian path, Reagan with his rights view, um, you know, Christine Korsgaard has adapted, you know, Kantianism. But to my mind, and, and there are, you know, feminist care ethics and virtue ethics and deontological ethics, there's all sorts of different choices you can take. Um, and I find them all fascinating, and I think they have different benefits and challenges. But the most important thing for me, and I think you've emphasised this too, is setting that moral scope. So in a way, I don't really mind which ethical system or selection of systems you want to choose as long as you're not excluding any sentient suffering beings from serious consideration um so it's i'm deliberately trying to keep i guess this framing of sentientism as ethically pluralistic and very broad as a platform and then you know there's so much more that we could still fight over but that scope of moral inclusion has to be to me is the most important thing but yeah i I feel the same way right my concern in what I've done uh, is always been a kind of bottom bottom line concern. Uh, is there less suffering in the world uh, because of your adherence to utilitarianism or virtue ethics or whatever? If that's the case, good, well, that's fine. Um, could we do even better? Uh, maybe, but you know, I don't uh, 
I, I don't think there is any one um, moral system that uh, will fit every situation, will fit every context. Is that people come out of different social backgrounds, they have different problems that control them. You know, we in the technologically advanced uh, uh, world here have much different uh, concerns than an Eskimo does or some uh, person living in a much more deprived technologically uh, situation. So I think keeping an eye on well, is, is the code really, is the system trying to encourage people, given the problems they're facing, to try to be compassionate, respectful of others, not being just simply self centered As long as that's the, the case, then they should work at it. Um, I never really felt that uh, doing ethics is something where one constructs some kind of grand system that has a, uh, um, a basic principle and then everything is derived in a logically tight manner from that. And of course, was the Cartesian uh, you know, plan, hope for philosophy. And I think it's carried over into ethics of various sorts, whether it be utilitarian or cognitive. I think really you know, morality is a historical process that's developed. And what we need to do is to try to keep that side of the battle, and I think morality is a battle. I mean, it's, there's a struggle between self centeredness and other centeredness, and it's not going to be a simple triumph. Uh, all the way through 2037, aha, you know, we're all totally uh, empathetic and compassionate. That, that, that's the, uh, it's going to be a continuing struggle, and we work at the problems that we have some purchase on. Uh, it's kind of like Voltaire had told me to say, you know, we end up cultivating our own gardens. Got to make sure that we do the best and keep the weeds down. You know, put it that way. We're in the gardens that are uh, really good, we have some purchase. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Now, one of the, um, I guess there's almost a sliding scale of moral scope that you can choose from, right? There's anthropocentrism. There's, I think, where you and I are, which is a sentiocentric view focused mostly on sent sentience. Some people will go beyond that into biocentrism or ecocentrism or some sort of holism where they're, they're granting moral consideration to even to non-sentient entities as well. Um, but even within the sentient space, there's a really challenging topic that I think is problematic, even for many in the animal advocacy and the vegan communities and people who are you know, very serious about the evils of animal farming and animal exploitation, which is wild animal suffering. And I think if you asked, um, you know, many people who are active in the animal advocacy world today, they'd say this is a very new area. You know, so there's some interesting thinking being done. There are some new charities that have started up in the last few years who are starting to focus on this space. Some people are trying to starting to take it seriously. Um, but you addressed this very directly in Morals, Reason and Animals in 1987 as well. And I find, I find that fascinating because it is a logical implication of taking sentience seriously. Um, you know, if this isn't just about uh, having a compassion for sentient beings that humans actively harm, it's having a compassion for moral patients, even if humans aren't involved in their suffering at all. So, yeah, it's, it, it, it's it would be fascinating to understand where you're thinking about wild animal suffering has come from and developed. Yeah, I think that one of the chapters in Moral was Reason and Animals called about saving the rabbit from the hawk, I think. And I, uh, I wrote um, one of the early articles was on predation as well. Um, I think I have you know, a number of things to state. But first of all, uh, we're trying to make we're trying to make the world uh, a place that involves no suffering. So if our interference and the natural order is the natural order is it's not just red and tooth and claw, but a lot of lots of it is red and tooth and claw. I mean the, the idea that nature is entirely self-centered is just wrong. I think we'll see it show that very nicely that the uh, having uh, uh, having 
connections, relations to others, and caring for their well-being is part of the natural order of the good as predation is part of the natural order. So in nature, there is uh, all kinds of, you know, are all kinds of dependencies. And if our, out of our sense of compassion for the prey, uh, you know, so get rid of the predators, if that ends up actually causing more suffering, then it uh, prevents, then we're not being faithful to our moral imperative to try to ease suffering. Uh, there are areas of the world where we do have some control, part of our garden, and we could indeed you know, control the suffering of animals. Certainly, if we see that the animals on the range are um, you know, uh, starving because of a drought or something, wild horses, other you know, wild animals, I don't uh, ever see any reason for not doing that. That we can uh, give them some food and try to help them get through this because we are uh, increasing their lives without actually interfering with the natural order when the rains come again and we be able to eat the naturally produced food. But uh, in the meantime, we can certainly help them um, get through this, uh, this tough time. Um, as for um, trying to you know, prevent predation. Um, I I don't know how one is going to do that in a large scale uh, without trying to imprison animals and and do anything of that. So I don't think nature, you know, put it this way, wolves are not acting immorally by uh, killing rabbits. They are doing what they do in order to survive. And there's not, there's not a moral imperative for us to go in there and interfere with that unless by doing so we can make the world a better place and we have no suffering. But I, I don't think the goal of animal liberationists at this point should be to uh, worry on that level, on uh, global level. But we humans create so much suffering coming. And I think we should, first of all, you know, get our own houses in order, shall we say, and concentrate on things which you mentioned, like factory farming, the way we treat them, team and animals, uh, sport hunting, certainly a travesty, and you know, other sorts of things uh, that we do to animals. Anyway, without there being issues of wild animals. Yeah, thank you. And I think the it, it's a it's a difficult and challenging space because it's very complex. You know, we should be skeptical about human hubris and the nature of our interventions because we cause so much damage. Um, but despite those hesitations, I think the central thing is it, we might choose not to prioritize the making changes in that space. We might just decide it's too difficult, it's too challenging. But that's not an excuse for removing our moral consideration for, from those moral patients. They still count, you know, regardless of, you know, whether it's in our power or whether it makes sense to, to help them. And I think that's one of the important things in your work, because it, it feels to me that understandably a lot of um, human ethics and morality is focused on the moral agent. It's focused on judging, you know, the actions and the intent of a moral agent. And sometimes it forgets to think about the moral patient so that when, you know, suffering occurs that isn't directly caused by humans we we sort of deprioritize it or forget it which is strange because we don't tend to do that in the human sphere you know if there's a natural disaster that isn't caused by humans we still recognize the salience of the suffering but again in the non-human world uh, even many people who you know are devoted vegans and animal advocates will still say you know they have a reverence for nature that just suggests we should leave it alone and back away, even even though there is suffering within nature. So it's, it is a tricky topic. Yeah. I don't have a reverence for nature. I mean, nature is what nature is. Uh, it's a lot of you know, functional relationships. But within all those functional relationships, many of them do involve sentient beings, and therefore many of them do have impact on the, uh, the well-being, the quality of life. 
of uh, these things and beings. I don't think we need to revere the current order of nature. Uh, we should try to uh, ameliorate it uh, as far as you know, reducing the amount of suffering where we can. But I think we don't really have much purpose. Now, you mentioned human hubris. I think it is human hubris to think that we can somehow create a, uh, a garden of Eden where the lion lies down with the lamb and so forth. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. I can't imagine. We would ever be able to, I was certainly not in any position now to say, okay, let's take step A towards creating the new Garden of Eden. I don't think that's um, a very productive way of looking at what we can actually do to make the world uh, a place where there's less stuff. I think we first of all need to look at what we do, and as far as wild animals to help out where we can, recognizing that. Um, our ability there is really quite limited. But I think we really should have. I was thinking while you were talking here of a, a, um, one of these public broadcasting system um, nature series. So it was about a family of foxes that were living on an island and they followed them. And one of the little foxes was born blind. So I'm actually being uh, blind myself. I kind of focused on that. Um, and they uh, they you know, watched all the all of the family and so forth. And the last scene for that little blind fox is that he was sitting on the beach, uh, you know, the sand by himself. You know, he couldn't keep up with the others or whatever. And you see him sitting there, and then a wave comes in, and he's no longer there. And they are um, discussing they're making that film, they let him drown because they didn't want to interfere with the the pristine environment or nature. They didn't feel it was appropriate for them to interfere by saving this little hawk. And I think that is utterly immoral against people. Something really, really offensive. You know, they could uh, do their little filming and make their production. And they could pick up the little fox and take him to some refuge or sanctuary where he would be cared for and he would be able to lead uh, a decent life in spite of being blind. And they could have made their point about how his blindness made it impossible for him to lead a uh, successful life as a fox in nature without saying that somehow they couldn't, you know, soil their hair, or not soiling their hair, but they couldn't contaminate nature by getting involved to save this uh, this animal that was born uh, with an obviously you know, fatal defect. They could save that animal. That's one thing that we human beings could do, and they should have done it. But that's, so that sort of thing, you know, where we can see, if you see that a, a bird has a broken wing, a deer has a broken leg, uh, we find in the Bay Area, we found some uh, Baby seals and then starving out on the highway. So, you know, we pick them up and we take them to the marine mammal center and sauce them. We you know, get them healthy again and so forth and return them to the wild. But, you know, we don't say, well, that's just nature. He's you know, not able to survive. He's a weakling, so I just let him die. Uh, that's, I think, where we need that. We shouldn't be doing We should be healthy. In these situations, but I don't think these situations are kinds where we're going to be constructing uh, an idealistic replacement for a nature that does have lots of red and truthful colors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, the final question we come on to now that we've answered what's real and we've answered what matters is how can we make a better future? Um, and you've obviously, you've, you've worked and written on human ethics on non-human ethics um you're doing hands-on work running your sanctuary now as well um how do you think about how can we make a better future because it feels to me sometimes as i've done this series of interviews with an amazing range of people that as we look across the problems in the human world and the non-human world um maybe in the future into you know even artificial sentience um quite often the technical solutions aren't that difficult there are often really obvious win-win-wins that we could 
go after that would make things better for humans and for non-humans and for the planet as a whole. But the blocker often seems to be human psychology, social norms, political will. Um, so often it's our own, you know, human nature if, in a way that gets in the way and makes driving positive change so frustrating. Um, after your all of your work, how how do you feel about the future for humans and non-humans, and what are the best ways of trying to drive positive change? Well, I, I, you know, it fits in with what you know, I've been uh, talking about here. I think we have to see what talents each of us has, what the problems that we in our situation are confronting, and try to work with those. Um, there are several things that one can do. Um, for example, developing alternatives to um, animal uh, use that is exploiting animals and sacrifices their interests. They are. Um, if you can develop ways of testing chemicals or whatever that uh, don't involve animals, and especially if they're cheaper <laughs> than what involves animals, then that would be a good thing to do. If you're a scientist and you can aim at that sort of thing, that's a good thing to do. Um, I tend to think that one of the most important things is to try to get uh, more emphasis on compassion, empathy, caring for others, human and non-human, into the schools. The earlier we can encourage children to be empathetic and reinforce that to the school and social media, whatever. But that is really where uh, a lot of progress could be uh, made. Unfortunately, uh, children are still uh, the property. Sorry, my computer's just on top of it. The parents insist on trying to have their children replicate their values, their lives in many ways. It's some, something close to immortality, I guess, to have your children be a little little replicas of you. So you do what you say, you have a fight there with the uh, parents who are exploiting animals, you brought up to believe that was perfectly okay, and then trying to teach the children to question that and certainly re reduce it with this. But I, I think that's the thing that we're doing here and it's just general education worldwide. You're getting these um, uh, Podcast done with people from all around the globe. It's really very impressive. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be you know, part of it. But that that can do it too. I think we need to just take the talents we have in the situation where problems that we can work with and develop uh, develop ways of combating these things and finding alternatives. They like the uh, the new kind of non meat proteins uh, that. Uh, really tasty, much more so than uh, useful. I remember when I became a vegetarian in, say, the uh, Great Basin of the United States, the only thing available were Mrs. Shaw's granules. <laughs> and these were like cans, size of dog food cans, uh, ground up, I think mainly uh, soybeans. And you could use them to shape into a loaf and you could add garlic. Now, you can make it much more powerful, but, you know, go to a, a restaurant and try to get a vegetarian meal together. You know? um, so developing alternatives is important, whether it's in science, it's in animal consumption, uh, trying to substitute, and, and say, especially encourage children to be more empathetic. I'm afraid, certainly in the United States, uh, education and politics seem to be going in exactly that the direction. We have a new emphasis on self centeredness and goes under the name of individual freedom or something. But you know, putting your choice not to get a shot about the public safety, that you're getting a shot is important for. Um, that's, you know, again, something that needs to be combated. But I don't, I don't really see any grand achievement, especially with different cultures. You have lots of cultures still where they're just coming out of impoverished situations. And of course, traditionally, in many cultures, meeting was a sign that you would arrive, that you were a success and so forth. So as people do move from lower to middle class, they go, oh, I need to 
increase the amount of meat I eat because I'm unsuccessful. Now, as a science, everybody that I'm successful. So we, we have lots and lots of obstacles to try to combat. And I just think you know, the commitment is to try to do the best you can with what you have in the situation. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I think you're right. One of the other themes that's run through many of these conversations is that just in the fact of the matter seems to be we have to just make it easy for people to do the right thing. We, we can't just expect moral argument by itself to be enough. We know that's a slow process. But as you say, we, you know, in the field of experimentation or in the field of food, if we can find cheap, fast, easy you know, alternatives, it's already so much easier to go you know, vegan now than it was when you know, you, you made those changes <laughs> years ago, it will just continue. So if we can make it easy for people to do the right thing, that's important. And, and your point about education, I think, is also very deep. You know, I've spoken to Zoe Weil and some of her team from the Institute for Humane Education. And in a way, that's what they're really trying to focus on is recognizing that if from, you know, embedded in education, instead of taking, um, you know, young people who I don't want to be naive about our sort of default ethics but i think most young children are quite naturalistic you know they explore the world they try to understand things they try and work things out they're like little scientists in a sense and i think they do have some degree of innate compassion you know most young children are upset when their family are upset and they wouldn't want to you know harm another sentient being either you know you can see the relationships they develop with other um sentient beings around them i mean not exclusively of course you know there are small boys who will torture animals for fun but generally i think there is a latent compassion there um but then society you know either teaches you that it's okay to believe without evidence or teaches you that it's completely normal to uh you know exploit harm and kill other sentient beings for fairly trivial human pleasures and it's that you know education that really forces and drives some of the problems we see in the world today so i think you're right if we can you know at an education level start just infusing these basics about taking a naturalistic, you know, humble approach to understanding reality and a sentiocentric approach that grants compassion to, you know, any being capable of suffering or having interests, um, you know, that could drive quite deep change. So, um, yeah. I think in, uh, including uh, in uh, early education uh, classes on clear thinking, logic, which I spent a lot of, uh, indicating, you know, take as an example, well, you know, uh, you wouldn't want to be shot, so why why is it okay to shoot the deer? Okay, why is it that uh, you, know, you point out the arbitrariness we do use some of time of making these distinctions? Uh, if there is something wrong with um, you know doing this in one situation, why is it doing the same thing in another situation also wrong? And you get you know, we get people youngsters from thinking about this, and we try to get people to be logically consistent and compassionate, then we may start, as I say, I think the moral values did, with our relations with other human beings, but it very clearly, clearly uh, points going beyond that. And um, instead, we hope that people, youngsters, discover the world they want, I think, to develop their minds. There's a lot of them do. Some don't. <laughs> uh, but as those who do, you can get them to pursue this widening circle of compassion as part of uh, the logic of being a rational being. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I think, you know, I hope we're at a, getting close to a tipping point in human-animal relations and the extension of our moral scope of consideration to sentient beings and i think as that tipping point happens as we hopefully drive some quite revolutionary changes we'll look back at your work as being one of the seminal influences on shifting human ethics and thinking in a positive direction so yeah it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you are there any other things you'd like to add into the conversation before we wrap up no i just want to thank you now for those very kind words at the end here to thank you for doing the series and including me as a, a part of it. We were an old retired fogey like myself. It's nice to get together with younger people who are active uh, on the front here and to discuss ideas. So thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it and appreciate it. 
It's a real pleasure. And I will include in the show notes links to your new website, which has links to uh, all of your academic writing. So, and people can, you know, follow and uh, go and buy all of your books as well. So uh, and we've only touched on a couple of them here, but you, you have a, a mind blowing um, academic track record. So I will point people at those links so they can go and learn uh, more and read more of your work. Yeah, if they want to read the essays, I've found that my mind seems to work better with bits and pieces more than uh, I've published quite a few different articles. And um, I, they've been published in wide variety of journals in Europe and the United States and elsewhere. So I spent a year or so gathering them together. And if people are interested in reading them and seeing them in chronological order or whatever, uh, they have to go to just these sponsors spot. Um, and they're all there. Uh, not the not the translations, uh, but the other ones in English. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Stay in touch. Um, and yeah, it's been wonderful to have you as a guest on Sentientist Conversations. Thank you. Thank you.